The Miami Marlins are 6-1 and one after losing 18 players to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Marlins have found some life and some resiliency in the clubhouse, and they have found a way to claw and scratch to a 6-1 and one record to start the season after a sweep of the Baltimore Orioles in a four-game series. What's going on, guys? It's Ethan Badowski here to recap that series with the Baltimore Orioles. It was a four-game series. All four games were played at Camden Yards, but the Marlins were technically the home team for the uh, last two of them. They included a doubleheader on Wednesday night. And the Marlins really just showed a lot of courage. And what's going on in Miami right now really can't be overstated how impressive it is. The fact that the Marlins were able to rally after losing more than half their roster. Eight guys from the bullpen. They have to put together a makeshift roster. And here they are. They're 6-1. and one. They have the best winning percentage in the major leagues. They're on fire. Their pitching looks great. Their offense looks really good. And now they are move on to face the Mets. After a sweep of the Orioles. And they are on top of the world right now. We'll see how long it lasts. But as of now, just unbelievably impressive from everybody inside the Marlins organization. I mean, it really just can't be... You can't overstate it. It's unbelievable. We've never seen anything like the times that we're living in. We've never seen a season like this. And here come the Marlins with no expectations at all. And they're taking the world by storm so far. And we'll see how long they can keep it up. But nevertheless, what they've done so far is extremely impressive no matter where they go from here. So let's just jump right into the series and start talking about the Marlins and O's, these four games up in Baltimore. And let's go to the pad here. Let's start by um, naming a series MVP and a guy that I'm, this, this is an easy choice for me. It's Brian Anderson. What a series Brian Anderson had. He hit, he's in, what a season he's been having so far. His slash line so far sits at 304, 407, 652. That's good for a 1060 OPS, and he's got a 193 weighted runs created plus. Now, obviously, this is an extremely small sample size. The Marlins have only played seven games this year. But what an impressive start to the year for um, for Anderson. And he was really impressive in this series, too. We'll talk about him more as we break down each game. But he hit 307 in this series. He had a triple, a home run five RBIs in the series. He was a key factor in a lot of these wins and he was a big factor last night with his RBI with his uh, RBI two RBI triple. But it hasn't just been the offensive side of the ball for him. So far, Anderson already has two defensive runs saved and that's something that adds up over a year and and two is is good. You know, it, you're sitting at above average and it's 7 games into the season already. He's second among third basemen, only one defensive run saved behind Nolan Arenado, who is the best defensive third baseman in the game, at least in the National League, if you want to argue that Matt Chapman is the best in the game. So he's been doing it on both sides. He played some first base in the second game of the doubleheader the other night, but he's just been so impressive, and he is a really good hitter. He's so fun to watch, and the Marlins, this offseason, if he keeps this up, you know, at this level or even a little less than this level. The Marlins are going to have to extend him because he can be a huge part of this rebuild if he turns into a star or a superstar in this league. Let's get right into the games. Um, here we go. Game one was started by Pablo Lopez, and this was after the big layoff. This was the first game that the Marlins had played in over a week since they were in Philadelphia, and Pablo Lopez was scheduled to start, and he was impressive. Um not just from a baseball standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint. Not only was this the first Marlins game after losing 18 teammates to a pandemic, um, but this was the first game Pablo had pitched since losing his dad in July. And he talked about how much it affected him. He took time away from the team when it happened. Um, and and obviously losing a father would be tough on anybody. But Pablo, it, it seemed really, really tough on him, and he was having a real hard time with it, and clearly he had something on his mind when he went out to the mound on um, Tuesday night because he was spectacular. He went five innings. He only let up two hits, didn't allow a walk or a run. He had seven strikeouts in five innings. His changeup looked great. The fastball had some life to it, and uh, he was just really, really good, and the changeup is turning into if he pitches like that with the change up the whole year it'll be a top level pitch it's really really an impressive pitch I think the most impressive thing for me with Pablo was 61 of uh, 43 of his 61 pitches were for strikes 
And and that's something that you want to see with him is pounding the zone, you know, working on the black, getting swings and misses, and that's something that he was doing the other night. So it, it was a really great start for him. I thought Mattingly could have given him a little more length, but obviously it was his first start of the season after a big layoff, so 61 pitches was fair. The bullpen, as it was for most of the series, was great right after him. And it was two new guys and two old guy, um, guys that had been on the roster before. It was Hoyt, Blyer, Boxberger, and Kinsler. They want to combine four innings pitched. They did not allow a run, and they struck out five. It was a 4 nothing win for the Marlins, and the biggest hit of the game was Aguilar's... Uh, or was that the one nothing win? Sorry, that was the one nothing win. I can't remember exactly. But anyway, the big hit of the game for the Marlins was the Aguilar home run, and boy, was it a shot. I mean, we haven't we we haven't seen home runs like the one that Aguilar hit. We haven't seen power like Aguilar's really in this organization since Stanton left, and he doesn't have the power that Stanton does. But I mean, he just hit an absolutely majestic home run, um, and it was really a sight to see. So he came up with the big hit, and the Marlins got the win in Game 1. Let's move into Game 2. Eliezer Hernandez was on the mound. This was the first game of the doubleheader, and for the rest of the year, doubleheaders are going to be two seven-inning games. So this was a seven-inning game. Eliezer Hernandez was tremendous. Um, he went four and a third. He allowed two hits, only one walk, and five strikeouts. Didn't allow a run. Um, and then it, it went to the bullpen right after her with Vincent, Blyer, and Kinsler. They went 2.2 innings pitch combined. They didn't allow a run, and they struck out two. So the bullpen through two games was clean, and this will be a pattern for the Marlins that you'll see here. They were really spectacular um, in this series. It was a huge part of the Marlins getting four wins, especially um, last night. Um, Brian Anderson had a home run. And Corey Dickerson had two walks in that game. That was the offense for the Marlins. Um, I'm pretty sure that was the one nothing game. And then Aguilar added on in the first game, and that was the 4 nothing game. Sorry for not being super clear on that. All right, let's go to the second game of the doubleheader. This was game three of the series. It was a bullpen game for the Marlins. Mattingly um, put off starting Jordan Yamamoto. He was originally scheduled to start game three, but he put him off um, to start game four. He started last night. We'll get to him in a second, meaning it was a bullpen game for the Marlins, and the bullpen was very solid. Um, Josh A. Smith got the start. He went two innings, allowed only one hit and one walk, no runs. He struck out um, a batter. We saw Sterling Sharp for the first time, a Rule 5 draft pick from the Mar for the Marlins from the Washington Nationals organization, a guy that the Marlins are very high on that a lot of people are really excited to see. He made the roster as a Rule 5 pick. That's always big news. So anyway, um, Sharp went 1.2 innings. He only allowed one hit, and he struck out one. It was a clean um, outing for him. He looked really good. Um, he, he had a base runner on, and Brian Moran came in. Um, a submariner, we saw some Moran last year, and he is, you know, lifetime minor leaguer, and he got his shot in the bigs last year towards the end of the season, and he was pretty good, and he was really good in game three. Um, he pitched one inning. Uh, again, he got the last out of, um, I guess it was the, let me do some math here, it was the fourth. He got the last out of the fourth, and then the first two outs of the fifth, and they were all strikeouts. So he, his line... Rests at one inning pitch, no hits, no walks, three Ks. Um, Justin Schaefer came into the game. Um, he's a Gator great. He's one of the new additions for the Marlins. Um, he is a Florida Gator. I did not know until I was driving home and listening on the radio, and Glenn Geffner mentioned it. But Gator great Justin Schaefer, um, he did allow the, the first run that the Marlins bullpen had allowed since they were in Philadelphia. And actually, the first run that the entire Marlins pitching staff had allowed in about 24 innings. Um, so that was um, a really impressive run that the Marlins were on. But again, it was only one run because Schaefer went one inning. He had a walk, a hit, allowed the run, and he struck out two as well. Stephen Tarpley, a lefty who is going to be the lefty closer for the Marlins in situations where they need a lefty. Um, he took over, got the last out of the sixth, and then went clean in the seventh and picked up the save. So the Marlins went up 2 nothing in that in the first inning in that game, and then they let up the run from Schaefer, but they were able to hold on. So that was just showing the strength of the pitching that the Marlins had in this series. 
And that is probably the most impressive part, is this bullpen was so pieced together. They made so many acquisitions, called so many guys up from um, Jupiter, and yet they were able to be really, really good. I mean, the bullpen was really good. Um, they only allowed three or four runs in the series, so that was just really impressive. That was a huge vote of confidence for the Marlins and for this um, makeshift bullpen. Really, really exciting. Um, game three was a quiet offensive day. It was only 2-1, but the Marlins picked up the win. Let's go on to game four, the final game of the series. This was last night, and this was the biggest offensive explosion of the series um, for both teams. It was a very exciting 8-7 game. Sorry, I've got the Panther game on here. Um, they're up down 2-1 with 15-23 left in the second period, um, trying to even up the series and force a decisive game five against the New York Islanders. That's why I keep peeking over there. But let's focus up here on the Marlins. Shout out to the Panthers. Game four, Yams, as I mentioned, was moved from game three back to game four. He got the start last night. Um, it definitely wasn't his cleanest. He went four innings, allowed six hits and four runs, and in, in, that was two home runs. Um, I'm not sure all the runs came on the homers, but he did give up two home runs. So it was kind of a tough start for Yams. Um, if you want to take some positive out of it, you know, we talked about how he needed to get back up, you know, get more strikeouts and walk less people. That was kind of what he struggled with last year. He didn't walk anybody and he had four strikeouts in four innings last night. So that's definitely some a good takeaway from this Yams start, despite the fact that he was kind of roughed around. It wasn't clean from him. Um, but he didn't walk anybody, but they were getting to him. The bats were getting to him. Um, obviously not a good start from him, um, but, you know, signs are there that it can improve, and I think Yams is a good pitcher in this league. I think he'll be solid, and the Marlins can rely on him. But let's talk about the offense before we get to the bullpen because the offense really was what stole the show. As I mentioned, the Marlins scored eight. Um, they had 11 hits. VR was 3-for-5. He led off the bottom of the first with a home run. That's the first time we've seen him go deep out of the one spot. Um, he had two RBIs in the game. Francisco Cervelli and Logan Forsythe both went 2-for-4. And then Brian Anderson once again stole the show. He was 2-for-4 with a triple. And he had um, that triple was a 2-RBI triple. And then he also drove in a run with a single. Uh, he And it was actually the game-winning RBI. That it put the Marlins up 7-6. Um, and it, it, the triple did, excuse me, it was the other way around, two RBI single, one RBI triple, um, but he was just fantastic, great defensively, um, made some really nice defensive plays all series, and as I mentioned, he got the winning RBI in game four. Um, let's move to the bullpen now. We saw the first of Jorge Guzman. Um, he pitched an inning plus. He had a clean fifth, um, three outs um, uh, you know, into play, no strikeouts, um, the ball kind of jumped off the bat of the guys because he throws so hard, but he was locating, you know, putting 99 on the corner. It was pretty impressive. Um, he was able to go clean in his first inning, but it kind of blew up in the sixth. Two home runs in the sixth, so it was a little tough for him. Um, the home runs were hit hard, um, and, you know, it, it, it was kind of what you see with Guzman, which is where he has a good inning, and then it kind of blows up. And that's kind of why I think his best, um, you know, the best place for him is at the back end of the bullpen. I think he can make a really good closer. Um, but the Marlins give them credit th to the bullpen. Again, they were able to come in and mop it up. Um, you know, the rest of the way, they only allowed one run, and it was Kinsler with a two-run lead in the ninth. But he was able to shut the door. Morin went clean. Boxberger had pitched an inning where he had two strikeouts. Um, and then Kinsler shut the door after letting up three hits and a run in the ninth. So really just unbelievable from the Marlins. I mean, so impressive. The resiliency of this team to go down, have what happened to them happen, and then come out, win four straight ball games, and play the way they did with energy, with life, and 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 learning from their mistakes. You could see the Marlins. They weren't high-fiving. Everybody was wearing masks in the dugout. You know, they were doing what they were supposed to, and I think the Marlins have really learned their lesson, and they're going to fight for those guys that they lost um, and, and give them credit. It's been unbelievable. It, it's so, so impressive. I can't say it enough. Um, before I wrap up, I want to talk about two guys. I want to talk about Monte Harrison and Lewis Brinson. Um, neither had the best results in this series. I think there was only one combined hit between the two of them. Brinson played twice. Monte played three times. But 
we saw improvements, especially from Brinson. Brinson's approach looked really, really good. Um, he was seeing the ball a lot better. He wasn't swinging at pitches that he would have been swinging at last year. He had some really good takes, um, taking curveballs in the dirt, taking fastballs away. Like I said, pitches that he'll normally swing and miss at. Um, so it was really good to see him um, working deep counts. He worked a walk, you know, just better. It was better all around from Brinson, and then obviously the defense was great. Let's talk about Monte Harrison. Only picked up one hit in the series, and it was an infield hit. But I think there was some complacency with Monte. You could see that he was a little nervous um, for, you know, his Major League debut. And rightfully so. It's his Major League debut. You know, it, it makes sense that the guy would be nervous. But the approach was there at the same time. You know, he had some good takes for a guy that's known to strike out a bunch and as a power hitter especially. He was taking curveballs in the dirt. He was taking curveballs away, um, especially as the series went on. You could see him taking more and more pitches and, and working better at bats. Um, and then you saw the speed on display. I mean, he just flew down the baseline for that infield single. Um, and his def his defense, he made some great plays in the outfield, made a sliding catch, made a running catch, and he made... Tough plays look pretty simple, um, so he was really spectacular, and he showed like gold glove um, caliber potential out in center field, and I always thought of Monte as a right fielder. Some people always told me he's a center fielder. He's a center fielder. He's 100% able to capable of playing center field in this league, and I think he will. So I expect better results from Monte and Brinson. It might take some time for it to come, but the approach was there, and it was certainly exciting to see them back on the field. So where do we go from here? Okay, we go to New York next. Um, we go to Buffalo after to play the Blue Jays. But New York is next for a three-game series tonight, Saturday, and Sunday. And we see Jacob DeGrom, the best pitcher in the league, on Sunday. So a big series for the Marlins to keep some momentum going. We'll see how they look. We'll see where the record stands after Sunday. And we will talk then.